afternoon with Diane Washa, and we're going to discuss the wonderful paintings in her current show, Steadfast. I want to thank the live audience that's here because there's a little winter storm happening and you are all brave for coming here. Um, it's a real testament to your fans, Diane. Well, thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about Diane. Um, Diane is an award-winning painter who takes inspiration from the changing landscapes she has had in view since road trips with her family as a child. Washa is most well known for her works done in plein air. She came late to her now productive life as a studio artist. A business, business executive by day, she got more serious about her lifelong passion for painting in 2005 and several years later was exhibiting her work. Washa has a degree in fine art from Milton College and an MBA from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. She has continued her painting studies, taking private courses with a number of admired painters, and is part of a network of artists dedicated to the end plan year approach. In 2008, I believe, was the first time that we featured your work when our gallery was in Pale Live. And you came to our attention because the wonderful painter John who I'm not sure if you were just friends or if you had taken courses. We took a winter player workshop. Um, I went to him and said, we need more artists for this plein air painting show that we're hosting. I know that you're connected in this community. Is there anyone that you would recommend? And he said, there is this emerging artist, but I think her work is outstanding and you might want to consider her. She's not well known. There's nothing impressive at this point about her resume. And so myself uh, and Ann Orleski, the your gallery director, we were all impressed by that work back then. And we included it in the show. We got a great response. And you've just continued to grow as an artist. And the work is really outstanding. And I think that this is some of the finest work you've done. Thank you. So, um, thank you for this body of work and thank you for being here today. So, um, I think, so a lot of times when we invite artists to have a solo exhibit, we give them at least two years, if not a little bit longer time, because this is a very large space to fill and it takes a long time to create a, a serious body of work. So I think that we asked you about three years ago. I think it was the summer of 2020. Okay. Um, and, and I'm asking all this because a lot of things happened between then and now. And the show is called Steadfast. So the first thing I want you to do is talk to us a little bit about the title and how important that is um, relating to get, getting this work done. Well, so you don't really come up with the title for a show until the body of work is finished, I think. And what happened to me, so with like everyone else in the world, you know, the pandemic hit, and then um, I broke my hip. a lot, so that Yes, I'm sorry. And then I broke my hip in 2020, and they said it would heal. And so I limped around for a year, and it didn't get better. And so in 21, I had hip replacement and then you know I had a, a good 10 months of recovery from that. So most of the from when I was you know um, asked to have a solo show I couldn't paint. I couldn't stand, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do, I couldn't, you know, it's horrible. Especially because plein air landscape painting is very physical. You have your easel, you have your paints, you have your umbrellas, you have wet canvases, dry canvases, towels, you know, mosquito netting, you <laughs> You're climbing around <laughs> down this way yeah, so, in the woods or something. And, and so I got a lot of, you know, people knew I was preparing for a show, and they said, well, you must be getting a lot of painting. And it's like, no, <laughs> I can't even stand. So it wasn't, I had a coming to Jesus moment with Diane in January of 2022. And I said, okay, where are you? And my plan for my previous show in 2019, right before the pandemic hit, I had 30 paintings, and I did the math. I'm you know, a business person. So I had 12,000 square inches in 30 paintings. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do again for this show. 
And so in January, I had maybe nine paintings done that were not even done. They were in the works or almost done. That meant I needed to do another, what, 20, 21 paintings. So it's like, holy cow, you know, that's less than 20 months away. And, and then it was like, well, what can you commit to? You know, can you go into your basement and paint for two hours a day? It's like, yes, I, I can commit to that. The basement is nice, by the way. That sounds like a grill. Well, it is kind of, it's, I prefer being outside. I don't really like yes. painting in my yes. basement. So anyways, um, I put together that and it's like, okay, if I do that, then, you know, two hours never is just two hours. You will end up in six hours, 10 hours, 12 hours on painting day. Um, but then, uh, where was I taking that? Oh, so the number of hours. And then, but it, and, and then it would be like 36, 40 hour weeks, or if I did 20 hours a week, it would be, you know, 16 weeks, something like that. And it's like, can you do that? It's like, yes, I can. So I knew I could get the body of work done if I really focused hard. So, and then just in, after we hung the show, then I look back at some of the photographs, because you'll take photographs of, you know, the work, the progress that you're making. And most of the stuff was done in 2022. So when I was in October, I think I was 97% done. And by the November, I put the final brush stroke on one of my paintings. So you know, 100% done by November. And I was totally depressed. <laughs> and I should have been you know, joyous because, oh, the work is done and it, and it turned out well. And I realized I was just exhausted. So after I, I realized that, it's like, okay, that's okay. <laughs> you deserve some downtime. So, so, so the next thing was like, well, what do we call this body of work? So part of, you know, normally it would have been, everything would have been started, even some of the large paintings done outdoors. Um, but because I couldn't really get out and be outdoors because I couldn't see the water and carry things, I did, I, I, what can you do? You know, so could I continue to, you know, get into my car and take some photographs and work with photographs, so I did some of that. And then I could also look at some images online, like some of the bird portraits. Well, all of bird portraits were done from photographs. So that was another um, opportunity to make art. And then I have one that was uh, William Merritt Chase, the, the one of the fish. And that was a reproduction of uh, a classic painting. So through all of that, what held them all together was just, I guess, the my temperament making the art. You know, that I, I it, it took a lot of grit and determination. <laughs> and I was telling the gals when I came down today, and also maybe a pinch of stupid. <laughs> so that's the theme behind Steadfast. Like driving here today. Yeah. Yeah. Great determination. That was, pinch of, yeah. So that was a long answer to a no, short question. No, but it's important, but, and I think about, so because, you know, you had to modify the way that you paint right. to accomplish this. Right which takes a lot. So you found new ways to work. So, you know, um, are there things that you had learned to employ in your painting practice in the past few years? I know some of it was taking photo references from a car, from a place that you couldn't walk to or set up your easel right. because you weren't mobile. Now you're more mobile again. Oh, yeah. So um, are there things that you learned in the past few years that you think you'll continue to keep in your practice that surprises you or not, or do you not know yet because you know I really <laughs> had a <laughs> chance to yeah, really, you're still recovering from this body. True, trip. true. I don't I think part of I, I like to think that even though some of these paintings were taken from photo references, that they still embody a freshness or like you were on site making or in the field, I'd like to say, painting. Um, so I think that there's a, that's the whole notion of plein air landscape painting is to be outdoors and capturing light, and you have to do it quickly. You have a two and a half, three hour window to get something on, you know, on your canvas. And the story behind, well, a good example of that was the this one, um, which I called Steadfast, and it was uh, the coastline of May uh, the Atlantic Ocean in Maine. And in my last show, I did a small little study, and it was a nine by twelve. And then at the opening, or not, uh, during the uh, 
while the exhibit was up, I did a demonstration here and I took the small 9 by 12 and then made it into a 18 by 24 and used the study as a reference. Well, I got it so far and it's like, oh, I don't have enough information in that little study that I had. And I had no photo references. So it's like, okay, well, that painting just hung around on my easel for a while, well, for three years actually. And so the next year was a pandemic, so I couldn't get back to, uh, it was called Betaford Pool, to take a photograph or to get out there and paint. Um, so I, we didn't visit in 2020 and 21. I, we were out there, but I couldn't climb over the rocks to get down to the place where I was, where I was painting, so I could even take some photographs or even paint the painting. And then in 22, 2022, we went back again to Maine, and this time I could actually climb over the rocks because I had my hip replacement and take some photo references. I didn't take my paints out there. I could have because I was healthy enough to do it. But I brought this one, and some of the people in the audience are my neighbors, and they saw me in my garage putting the finishing touches on, on this particular painting. But I, I really, I think this is a nice example, because this is a very, you know, we don't have those kind of rocks in Wisconsin. You know? But it was really fun, because some of these, the values and, and the uh, temperature of some of the, um, the paints that were used in the painting, you couldn't really, you can't really capture when you're outside, you know, because your eyes are so dilated and you really need to kind of let them uh, relax and, and put some of the finishing touches on there for your work. So that one in particular, I thought, was a real good example of being steadfast. I worked on it for three years. <laughs> so long as the year came Exactly. So, so that's a good example. Yeah. No, and that's interesting because that made me realize, you know, when you, when, when you talk, when I talk with landscape painters, or anyone does, right. um, people who are beginning at landscape paintings are trying so hard to capture the landscape that sometimes I think they forget that in the end it has to be a good painting. Yeah. And one of the trickiest things is editing and being able to know how to make it a good painting after that. And, you, and, and all the challenges that come up when you're out in the world because no one's editing anything for you. It's it must be overwhelming to have everything in your vision. Your eyes are dilated. Right. Maybe the sun is shining, okay. and the colors seem different outside than when you bring it inside where it's going to be. And it's really a very very challenging it thing is. to do. And that's the beauty of it, and, and that's the excitement. I mean, part of me, I love being outdoors, and so the painting aspect is just it's a good reason to get outside and experience nature. And if you're you know you're just it, it's just so much fun because yeah. you're, you know, you're in the elements and clouds are coming in. There's some where just this past summer I was going up to a wedding in Minneapolis. It was one of my friend's daughter's wedding and I wanted to paint my way up there and paint on the way back and we had rain every day and it's, oh my goodness. But um, I did it. But you know, you had to work fast because everything is changing so quickly. So I think that's that's the beauty of doing plenty of landscaping. It's that you have to make very quick decisions. And then you take that and, and it, you incorporate incorporate some of what you're learning in the field in the work that you do when you're in your studio. So it's, yeah, that's what it's all about. Well, I'm glad you talked about Steadfast, the painting yeah. Steadfast. Yes. And then there's a couple of other pieces um, of Steady and Inveterate that I think would be really interesting to talk about. Now, Steady is... One of, it's that painting. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Or we could talk about this whole series of three, right? I think we need to. Because these three yes. were all, correct me, but these were all painted in a similar area. Yes. So talk yes. about that. Since so, this one, its original name was um, Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, yeah, some of my other artists were, you may want to change the name. So, and I, now it's called Dedicated. But a little different. <laughs> a little different. A little bit more, you know, brighter. But this was wild, from a wild Lucid State Park uh, overlooking the Mississippi River near the uh, Prairie du Chien. And it was done in the beginning of May um, in 2020. You know, so where were we then? You know, the lockdown started March 16th, I think. And we were still like, what? <laughs> it sends chills down my spine when I think about it. 
It was just horrible. So I was up there. There were no ranger stations. The gate was open, but I was the only, I felt like I was the last person on earth. And it was so quiet and desolate. And so I did this painting. It wasn't, I didn't get it completely finished, but uh, so I, I brought it back. And then it wasn't until this year, almost a year, well, what was it, almost two years later, and I changed the sky. It's usually the sky, once you, you're out in the field, um, when you go back into a painting, the sky usually needs to be adjusted. And I ended up putting all of this dark greenness in. And it, it felt right when I did it, but now when I had more time to reflect, I think it kind of embodies the mood that we were in the country. You know, that it was so dark and everything was so uncertain. So anyways, that was the story of this piece. And if anyone's been to Wild Lucy, you know how gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I love painting the Pacific River. It's, it's one of my favorite places. And wait, that, that was May, you said, Diane? That was May, May of 2020. Yeah, this is beautiful, though. Like, oh, and Because we haven't talked about this specific painting, and I would not have thought it was heavy like that. Oh, yeah. If you had told me. I mean, it seems like an overcast day. But it's beautiful, and and when you were talking about that, it made me just think about um, a Margaret Atwood quote that I just read. That was within every dystopia, there's a little utopia. Oh yeah, and I think yeah. that was my there you go. utopia yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it's yeah. it just to me it looks peaceful and beautiful on a cloudy day. But yeah. it's great. To there was too. more. There was a much bigger backstory. Yeah. So anyway, so that was then. And then in this past January, when I was still just recovering from my hip surgery, January of 22, um, and I really still couldn't stand or walk or what have you. Um, it, but what I could do is get in my car and take photographs, which I, and I love photography. It was what I grew up with. My dad taught me how to do it, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, so then I went back to McGregor, which is on the other side of this over there. Oh, there's a flood. <laughs> on the other side of Wild Lucing is McGregor, and there's a state park called Pikes Peak. And so from there looking, oh, from Iowa looking at Wisconsin, that was that one. And so this, sorry, um, is actually Wisconsin and heading north you know, up the uh, Wisconsin River. So it's the backwaters of the Mississippi. And then this one was actually taken from this peak looking north. And this piece was interesting <laughs> because I my style is it's different. I don't put a lot of detail in some of these, you know, the landscapes. Um, but I did the piece and I was going to photograph it. I started photographing it in my basement, couldn't get a good image. Then I brought it into my kitchen, couldn't get a good image. Brought into the living room, couldn't get a good image. Took it into the garage, couldn't get a good image. Finally took it outside, leaned it against the pillar next to my garage, took a photograph, and then it falls over. <laughs> Cracks the frame it's in, it's kind of dented the corner, <laughs> and it's like, oh. So I took it back downstairs, and then I just whacked away at it. And it's like, oh, oh, I like, I like what's happening. No. <laughs> so that's part of, you know, knowing kind of paintings tell you what they need. And it obviously wasn't, it was telling me, you're not a dead with me. Really loudly. I know. <laughs> so, bam. And I, I love that one. So if only one. all paintings would just fall off the wall and we needed to work on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and that leads to another topic that we didn't really discuss is that paintings, I, oftentimes people ask me, when do you know a painting is finished? You know, and one of our instructors, Diane Rath, used to say, well, they, they talk, they tell you what they need. And so paintings tell you what they need. So when I had all of this body of work all in my, hung in my basement, it was, I didn't realize how noisy it was downstairs. Seriously. And then once I removed all the paintings to the gallery, the silence in my basement was incredible. <laughs> It's weird. Yeah. I mean, it's probably because everything was gone and the house seemed empty. But I swear to God, it was my paintings not talking to me anymore. Yeah. So it was really interesting. So they tell you what they need and, and being okay with that. 
you know, being open to that, I think, is part of the artistic process. <clears throat> so you talked about sort of the painting steadfast. Mm -hmm. There was a study done. Right. Do you often do studies first and then move up to the to another if you're doing a larger piece, especially? You know, is there, any, is there anything about, about your process and how you started painting that right. would be interesting or novel to what anyone else does? No. Yeah. No. I mean, the whole purpose is to, you know, learn about light and color and values and design and everything else when you're out in the field yeah. and then taking it, bringing that knowledge back into your studio. So I'd like to do more work with my, to repeat some of that work. You know, when I do a small study, then bring it in and then make it bigger. So, yeah. is it, do you often um, like a subject matter and then decide to paint it again? Yes. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think what I noticed too, um, you know, I've been painting now since 2006 in earnest. Yeah. So, you know, do the math quite a while. And it's not that I'm tired of Wisconsin, but it's awfully green. You know, when the weather is nice. <laughs> and so that's part, and a lot of, you know, the, we don't have a lot of upright planes. Or, yeah, we don't have a lot of upright planes. Like when you're out in, you know, in the mountains and you can see all these beautiful vistas. Well, a lot of our vistas are, you know, here and looking down. And so that's kind of what I was doing, looking at the vistas of the Mississippi River, looking down at things. And, and I, I really like that. So I, I see myself doing more of that kind of work, you know, yeah. taking, either painting those kind of images. And the other challenge with painting plein air is you can't, there's some beautiful places to paint, but there's no place to pull over and paint. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, yeah. I want to talk to the Department of Transportation. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be so close to green. I mean, all of the things, like Hawaii, well, a perfect example is spring green. You know, there's some gorgeous places and all those beautiful sand barges, but there's no place to pull over. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to, that I thought, is that I know that I think is very interesting about you as an artist, actually it's, I think it's very true of a lot of people. Artists get known for a particular, their own particular style, but the artists that they admire or are influenced by can can be varied and not at all seem to be indicative of the kind of work that you do. So for instance, there's lots of plein air painters or historic um, landscape painters that I know that you admire and love, and we could list some of them. Um, but you also love color field painters and mid-century painters, for instance, Mark Rothko. And so are those, like, for instance, the color field painters, and I know um, that you have a homage to Mark Rothko that is okay. in your home yes. that's quite marvelous, that you kind of keep painting over and over again, yes. which I think is very interesting. Yes, as one of my friends said, yeah. it's not archival, and you can't yeah. sell that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's super interesting, um, and I think it might be surprising to people. Have you always loved that period of painting as well as landscape? Is it something you came to later, and how does that inform well, work? yeah, that's a loaded question. Yes. So, are all of you familiar with Rothko's work? You know, just color fields, blobs of color. A lot of people would go, anybody could do that, and I'd say, try it. Mm -hmm. it it's very difficult because he used layers and layers of just color. It just it's it's amazing, and they're just blocks of color. But my word, I can sit in front of those and the ones that I've reproduced, and just sit there and look at them. It's fascinating, and I, I have I don't know what that's all about. Yeah. Other than I can get lost in looking at some of those. Um, so, so that there's that piece. Part of what I you know I retired right before the pandemic hit. I decided to retire, and part of my plan was, and I had this show coming up, and I thought I was going to be experimenting and doing all sorts of you know take my art to a, a whole new level. And it was going to be more abstract. I did. I did. I'm totally in love with these pieces. But I thought I was going to even get more abstract, more, you know, but what does what does that mean to me? You know, because I do I love doing representational work, but I also love abstraction. So I, I'm trying and right now I'm in that 
kind of in-between stage where it wasn't until all of this, when all of this was done, I called Teresa and said, when can I deliver the work? And I'm sitting around just looking at the artwork. And it's like, oh, okay. I, I kind of see where I could, you know, take this to a different level. I can't articulate that yet. But it, it may it may look a little not look, but you know, some of the images that Georgia O'Keefe does, where I was at her home in Abiquiu, and out of her bedroom window is this road going off to uh, Santa Fe or Taos, wherever the hell it was she lived in. Santa Fe. And it's like, oh, and she had this beautiful painting that you could see that was the road, that was her inspiration. So I see that maybe some of that might be going on with me, that I have some of these vistas or I'm looking down, but how do I make those into um, more abstract images? So I don't know where that's going, but I, I need time to practice and, and make some, a lot of mistakes. But I do think like the like Mark Rothko's work, there's lots of thin layers and veils of color right. where there's where it's about where the edges of the color meet. Mm -hmm. And that that does happen in the atmosphere in your landscapes. Right. Right. Um, where you could just sort of zoom in to any one of those areas and get lost as a viewer in the area where your color is being, which is quite marvelous. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the wonderful thing about making art is you really don't, you have to be open to all yeah. the possibilities and just kind of listen to your, and I'm, a, I'm an emotional painter. You know, there's, <laughs> we went to a wonderful workshop in September and then October I was at a plein air event and Iowa and the, with tons of artists right and everyone's talking about color temperature and this that and the other thing and just these kind of com very technical conversations and I made the comment that you know if I heard one more person talk about color value temperatures blah 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 my head was going to explode <laughs> I can have it because you know when you're it's like the game of golf when you're on the course you just have to hit the ball you know and, and be participating in the game and when you're painting, you, I don't, I can't think of all that stuff. You know, I'm just in the moment. I, I you, I've learned enough. You, you have, have a foundation. I have a foundation, and I just kind of have to. I don't want to think about is this the right value? Is this the right hue? Is this? I'm still learning that stuff, and I've done this for a long time, and I'm, you know, fairly accomplished in what I've done. But to make that, you know, the head and the hand and the heart all kind of sync together, it's a lot. And so just the, this conversation about color temperature is just like, oh. We're not going to touch it at all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to, I think it's, um, there's there's a, a lot of different ways that people come to being a professional artist. Mm -hmm. And some people study art, they get their master's degree, and then they somehow manage to continue doing that as a full-time thing. Maybe they're a professor, and then they... You know, manage to scrape together a living that way. So you have a, a fine art degree mm -hmm. from I'm assuming when you were twenty one. Did you get your degree in yeah. in art from yeah. Melbourne College, okay. which doesn't exist. Anymore. But you, when did you get that degree? Nineteen seventy five. Okay. So and then, so obviously, the desire to be an artist was from a time that you were very young. Not really. Not too young. How old? No. I you know. I've always been making stuff. Right. Okay. But, and then you took a break. You got an MBA. You had a successful professional. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's interesting. There's a few. George Shipperly is an artist we represented. He's someone else who's quite, a, like yourself, quite an accomplished painter now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, had a, had a, you know, I think five kids and, you know, had to raise them and had to get, like, a regular job in the world. Mm -hmm before he could retire them right. to keep painting and now right. he he's been you know a right. serious professional artist for another three decades right. because he is so marvelous right. and um my interest in high school was music okay oh. so i didn't take an art class yeah. until i was in college i so never took that art. whole time that you were yeah. working mm -hmm. in business world mm -hmm. did you did, did you have in your mind i'm gonna i'm gonna get back to painting was it something that you kept hoping to do? No, it wasn't until like 2000, what was it? I don't know, I had this, I was working at Daytex Amita, um, which was eventually purchased by GE, and I was working in the quality control 
um, department, and one of my supervisors, I said to my supervisor, when I retire, I'm going to paint. He was a graduate of Marquette, and he said, well, you better start now then. It's <laughs> <laughs> was, was like, oh, I think so. Good advice. Good, very good advice. And then my dad, in 2006, said, Diane, you ought to fill up your condo with paintings. And it's like, Dad, I don't paint. Um, and then after he passed away, it's like, okay, I was moping around the house. I was still missing him terribly. And so I thought, I'm going to take my supplies and go out and paint. So I did. I went up to Observatory Hill uh, on campus at UW, and I did a painting. And it turned out pretty good. <laughs> so I took it over to my friend, uh, Jan Worsetter's place, and said, look what I did. You know, I just said, oh, yeah. You know, and that started it. And so it was from that point forward. And then that's when we met Jonathan Wildey. And then he was painting outdoors, and yeah, it, it really kind of blossomed from there. Yeah. But I'd always been taking photography, too. Right. So I was always having, you know, had an interest in, in that. So Jan Norsetter is also a wonderful painter, for anyone who doesn't know that. Right. And, um, and Jonathan Wildey, yeah. of course, is a marvelous painter. Who's been, and he's the, he's the person who, like, started right away and has somehow managed to, you know, scrape together a, a living as an artist. So. Right, right. But um, I really enjoy business. I mean, my yeah. that was my. Yeah. You know, I can tell my, because you come to the gallery with spreadsheets <laughs> and <laughs> uh, charts. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yes. you know, in yeah. January where I did all the stats, and like thirty percent of my paintings were done. I had seventy percent, and I had ten months. So do the math. How many hours? And really, she'll come with like thing and all the credit and the thing and the spreadsheet and the sizing, <laughs> and it's all perfectly organized. And then there's someone like Jonathan who comes in with like. The back of an envelope, <laughs> like, scribbled on it, and sets it back. So. Well, you know, and so that that's a good segue to the what's happening upstairs in number five. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to talk yeah, about? So, so upstairs in number five is a show called um, Cultural Connections Express Art Express Club, which is a show of children who get together in a group. It was started by Pat Dillon. Who is also a painter, and um, it is a play, it's a safe space for kids who have a loved one um, who is incarcerated, um, and they have very specific problems or issues that they deal with. So it's a place that they can get together to feel really comfortable and happy, and then make art, which is great. And then Pat brings in artists in the community um, from anyone from triangular. Um, who does sort of street art and lots of graphic art in Madison, who's well known to someone like you. And some of the, the artists that work with the kids will um, have them study a particular artist and then do work inspired by that. And you chose. Well, Rothko. Yes. Right, right. And it just yeah. kind of lent itself. So I started volunteering with Pat's group just once a week yeah. um, last fall, beginning last fall. So they had this show, and they had no idea what having a show was like. I mean, they're, one is 11, the other is just all turned 13, or are going to be turned 13. So it was a really wonderful experience because they had to make the art, then they had to you know, sign the art, do that kind of stuff, then they had to give them titles, then they had to help, like, how much can we charge for our work? And then they came to the opening, the opening reception on January They were 13. so great. They yeah. were wonderful. Oh, yeah. It's like, who are these kids? Because when we're in class, you know, it's like chaos. It's like um, herding cats. But <laughs> so then they had to, you know, um, uh, pitch their work, talk, you know, walk people around the gallery and show them what they did. And it was just that full circle. It was really quite impressive to see. So they got the whole big picture because it isn't just about making art, it's all the other stuff that you have to do. Yeah. You know, including interviews like this. And there's there's a lot to the business of art. And don't get me started on that, because <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it's contradictory, you know, because art is really, you know, it's it's really in your soul, in your gut. It's it's for me, it's emotional. Yeah. <clears throat> it's hard for a lot of artists though to it's not hard to part with the work always necessarily, but well, that was originally. Yeah, was it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Is it hard now for you to part? With these no, things? it's it's interesting because I well one I can remember when I first after I got into the emerging art artist show with you, and then when I after that I remember collecting a bunch of work to take it to the gallery for the first time. 
I almost threw up. Oh, I was so nervous. It's like, oh, I hope she likes what I'm doing. Huh? Um, and at that point, I didn't really want to part with some of my better pieces. But now, you know, as long as I have a picture of it, um, I'm okay with letting it go. And but there are certain pieces I, yeah. I don't want you because there is a connection. Yeah. And don't you feel like, I think there's also a point where you reach a threshold as an artist where you realize that you can make another one. Right. That there'll be another one. Right. Um, I think sometimes when you're early on, you've actually, you've gotten to that place where you make a piece that you really feel like is, that piece is successful. And it was so hard won right. that you are reticent to get rid of it. But right. once you've done a number of pieces, you know that that right. is in you and right. you can do not that piece again, but right. another piece. Right. So it's okay. Right. Well, and I had a piece, the sunflower one, that was part of the show. That's the old. That's the only old piece here, and it was done in 2010. And and you loved and it. I so loved it, and it's like just because it was so fresh, it was so much fun, and it just happens. You know, there are times when you're doing a painting and it just works, and that's just a glorious. It's like how did that happen? And that was that piece. But it's like okay, I, I can let it go on this one. So and it's all. So, <laughs> So she did. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I shouldn't have. But, <laughs> yeah. So, oh, wait, so, so was there anything else about working with the kids that, that you wanted to say? Like, oh, it, well, without getting teary, <laughs> um, it's seeing them, you know, because they have, they've been, they have so many things that they're dealing with as young children, especially now. I mean, we all struggled with the events of the last three. It's been horrible. I can't imagine a worse time to be creative. I mean, that was the other thing. Oh, you must be making, you know, no, it was depressing and it was sad and, you know, it was just an awful period of time for us. But anyway, so the kids are dealing with living in the 21st century, but seeing them make art and being in the moment where nothing else matters, it is so cool to see. And then when they do something that they like, it's like, oh, you know, so it just, it, it's been a blast. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. And they were just so, we had a debriefing after the opening, and we came back here, and we were looking at the art, and we were just chatting about um, you know, their experiences, and they were just thrilled. So you, I, you could just see how much that experience, thank you, yeah. for having, you know, giving them the opportunity to, to do that. Yeah. So it, it was fun. Yeah, yeah they're great. Um, I guess just a little bit before we open it up to questions, we've been mostly talking about the landscapes. Mm -hmm. And there are some of my favorite paintings in this show are the ones that are stems of birds. Oh, okay. So I know you've done a couple of bird paintings before that mm -hmm. we've shown in the gallery, but um, these are just marvelous. Talk about, you know, why of all animals, birds, how, how do they, how do they well, I think, you know, what Jonathan you Wilde, that? who's been my, our bud, and we've been, you know, working with each other and Jan for forever, um, he is a falconer, yes. and so he mm -hmm. does a lot of bird paintings, and I have a lot of his bird paintings, so yeah. there is that connection. Yeah. And they're just lovely to paint. Yeah. They're beautiful. One of my favorite, though, was, I, his name there is Firm, but it, he was, um, uh, his other name was Don't Mess With Me or Don't Ruffle My Feathers. He's got kind of an attitude. And that some of the, those two images, and then the, there's another um, the blue here and on the other wall, uh, were images from the Getty, Getty, Getty images. And so um, that's where those images came from. But Ruffled Feathers was just so much fun. There's a technique of... You just use, it's an old master's technique where you take a lizard crimson and Indian yellow and um, olive green, and you have this mush, and it adds a very, very sepia tone. And then you just get your medium that's kind of soupy, and you get your canvas full of that stuff, and then you, you know, you shape, you, you know, draw the, the image that you're, you're going to be painting, and then you start removing some of the paint with like a, a towel. And then all it's like developing a, a, a photograph, right, in a dark room, and all of a sudden this little image shows up. So that was the background on him. So that's why you see some of those yellow and sepia tones, and those were natural, those were his natural colors. But he had just such a presence. 
And then some of the, and there were all, there was all sorts of other colors in his feathers, but I got to the point on that painting where I thought, you know what, he's done. Yeah. You know, I could add a lot more detail. And again, that's, that's another painting. Right. You know, part of the challenge of being an artist is knowing when to stop. And some people say, Diane, you should have stopped an hour ago. You came up with a whole new painting, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, so that was that was that piece. And then this other piece here, I don't forget the name of that one, it's a, the two hawks. Um, I love the uncompromised, thank you. Um, that was also known as siblings or entanglement. I know, I know this like. Yeah, so they had a lot of other names. All these pieces, by the way, were synonyms for the word steadfast. So that was just an, how do you come up with names for all these pieces? And naming pieces of your art is, is important. But anyways, that piece was done. There, I have a friend who has a friend who's going out birding, and he was just getting out of his car with his camera, and all of a sudden these two hawks were right in front of his car doing whatever the heck they were doing. And he took some photographs, and then my friend sent me the image and said, look at this. And I'm going, oh, do you think he'd mind if I paint that? And so I got permission from him, and, and so that's where that one came from. And then the, the heron, I don't know what that name is. Determined. Determined, yes. Um, that was, it was just beautiful, the blues and the grays and just the detail of all the feathers. And, and that was the one where, you know, it was like, okay, Diane, can you go down to your basement and paint for two hours? So I just, you know, would work on certain sections and lo and behold, before I knew it, I had the, the entire bird painted. So that's kind of the backstory. With, I love painting birds. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they're just marvelous. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things like, and they have an affinity with the landscapes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but you don't have much landscape or only an allusion to it a little bit in some of them, but it's mostly just, it's the bird right. coming out of the background. Right. But that's, it's still so, given that it's even more interesting how related they feel to the rest of the paintings. I think it's yeah. it's a testament to like, you could probably right. paint anything. I could right. give you a well, pile yeah. of tools and you would paint them and they would be related because right. you have a voice as a painter. And right. Well, you know, when you and Anne came over to my house, back in the summer, and I had my big Rothko, and I said, hey, what if I have, you know, some of these types of paintings? And because part of the challenge that Teresa has as a gallerist is, this is the body of work that Diane is known for, when, right. but if she comes in with all these color field studies and people are expecting this, how do you make that transition? And so now I'm at a point in my career as a painter, I could probably make that transition, and you can see. And so I was gonna do a couple of those types of paintings, but I ran out of time. Mm -hmm. But the big Rothko that I had is, which is mostly blue now, <laughs> with some uh, burgundy edges and a beautiful gold frame, um, it looks stunning with this body of work. <laughs> and it's like, oh, and I, but I just couldn't part with it because I needed something above my sofa. <laughs> it looks great. Thank you. <coughs> um, should we open it up to questions? Yes. Does anybody have any questions? thoughts or yes I was um, kind of surprised but when I got the flyer in your Christmas card with mm -hmm. the picture of the two birds and you kind of answered some of my questions about why you strayed away a little bit from landscape to mm -hmm. do the bird paintings and they're beautiful uh, is the technique really different I know obviously you can use a photograph and be in your own right. space to do it but as far as the, the brush yes. strokes and yes, the, yes. that's yes. a good question yeah, it is. I, and I think there's, yes, because they're very technical. Mm -hmm. And especially like with Jonathan, because he's a birder and a falconer, you've got to do it really right. Otherwise, we'll go, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> it has to be. Oh, yeah, you have, a, you have a pretty tough oh, like, slash judge yeah. when you get your bird painting. Well, so you have to, like, there was a group of guys that were artists that were also falconers. Oh. And so they really understand yeah, wow. birds. And so if you don't represent them correctly, they, they're they offended. But that's what I liked about Ruffle, Don't Ruffle Me, or his name is Firm, because it was more artistic and freer. Mm -hmm. But some of the others didn't lend themselves quite as, you know, they were more controlled. Mm -hmm. So it's a good question. But I, what I want to do, when I do, the next time I, and I will be, um, 
making more bird paintings. I want them so that they are more like firm, where it's it's more um, expressive. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like that's the way that your landscapes are usually? You're less yeah. worried about. Well, yes, because I don't get into a lot of detail. Yeah. You know, right. it's like, wow, <laughs> there's not a lot of detail there. Uh, you know, so that is kind of my style, though. There's some people who are very representational yet. Mm -hmm. I don't. It, it's interesting. Because there's just enough detail yeah. so that they have the gesture. And many people that have admired my work just said it's it's nice because I can fill in the detail. Mm -hmm. So it kind of right. leads it into the painting and then they finish it. So. You're creating a mood, you're in, mm -hmm. creating an atmosphere, a sense of the feeling of the place, right. not, right. not a and photographic it's, representation of it right. in any way. But we right. don't need that. We have our own eyes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's where the, the musician in me comes from. You know that that is, it's just when you're making music, it's such a, you know, it's in your bones and, and it comes out, and that's kind of what happens when I'm really in the moment when I'm painting. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Anyone else have anything? Yes. Do you keep your palette the same throughout, or do you change your palette palette? Or ah, good question. Um, I basically keep the palette the same, however, I'm shaking things up right now. Yeah. How so? so? Well, um, he's not up, but I did one painting. It was it was called Holy Thalo. <laughs> and that wasn't really the word, that a, Thalo was another word. Um, and it's a very Thalo blue is just very intense, and you don't want to get it on you. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. So I was in this painting workshop up in Madeline Island. We were on the coast, or you know, like on Lake Superior, and it was raining. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, it started to rain. And it's like, oh my God, pick up your painting because you know when it's raining, you can't really be painting outdoors. Um, and so my 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 brushes fell into my palette, into my blue phthalo, mm -hmm. and I picked them up and placed them over there, and then I forgot that they fell on my phthalo blue, and then I picked them up, and I had blue phthalo all over my hands on the white bench that I was sitting on mm -hmm. at the marina, <laughs> <laughs> and all my other artist friends were behind me painting over me looking at Lake, you know, Lake Superior, and they're laughing, and uh, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm experimenting with phthalo blue. <laughs> okay. So is your palette limited or? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, you know, the warm and cool reds, warm right. and cool yellow, and the warm and right. uh, cool right. blues. But, and then some of the other, another color that I just discovered is transparent brown oxide, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And it does a really nice job of neutralizing. I don't do a lot of out of the tube kind of paintings. You know, Directly, yeah, they're always modified. Yeah. Um, I want to know if that bench still has your phthalo blue on it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I tried cleaning it up as best as I could, and then I got out of Dodge as quickly as I could. <laughs> I, I didn't want them to see. Yeah. yeah. It probably does. Well, if you become really famous, they'll charge people to sit on the bench. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you for thank coming you. out. Um, I want to mention, for um, this is being videotaped, so people will be watching it after the fact. And this show, Steadfast, the group show that we have, Middle of Nowhere, and the show that's in gallery number five that we were talking about, Cultural Connections, Club Express Kids, Safe Spaces, are all up through February 26th. And um, we will be in person having a conversation with Pat Dillon, who is the person... Um, who works with the kids in Art Express Club, and that conversation will take place on February 4th, which is a Saturday at 2 p.m. Are you on your website? Yes. And this whole show, all of their great images mm -hmm. um, taken by Jim Escalante that are on the website of each of Diane's paintings mm -hmm. as well. So, thank you, Diane. Thank you, And thank Teresa. you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Drive carefully home. <laughs> <laughs>